Thank you to Kay and Ron Callender for reading the scriptures today out of Acts 28. So here we are at the end of Acts. We've spent the summer looking at Acts and really just kind of looking at all of the highlights in Acts. We've left a few things out. And by the way, by way of com commercial, if you would like to dig in deeper to Acts, we do have a Bible study that's in the process of doing that right now. And even if you join now, you would still get a lot out of it. And that he meets on Monday nights. But check our email for that. Um, anyway, so here we are at the end of Acts, our last sermon on, uh, in the book of Acts, at least for a little while. Now, I'd like you to remember when we were at the beginning of Acts, and Jesus is still meeting with the disciples, the risen Jesus, and he's meeting with the disciples, and he is teaching them. And we come to this moment where the disciples say to Jesus, is this the time when you will restore your kingdom to Israel? And Jesus doesn't exactly answer the question. Um, he answers maybe a different question, the right question, if you will. But he starts out by saying, only God knows the timing. But the Spirit's going to come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So that's the answer. And then Jesus, it says, was taken from them. And they're sitting there looking at the sky. And the angel says, to, some angel comes to them and says, what are, you, what are you looking at the sky for? Get going. And we see the beginning of Acts. And as we move through the book of Acts, what we discover is that indeed Jesus does answer their question, except that we're not talking about establishing the kingdom for Israel. We're talking about God's kingdom for the entire world. And we are seeing the establishment of that kingdom from that moment on. As the disciples become witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth, we are seeing the story of the establishment of that kingdom, of God's kingdom, as it spreads through the good news of Jesus Christ throughout what becomes the Roman Empire. And this is what it looks like. At first we see proclamation. Throughout we see proclamation. Proclamation with boldness, it said. We see it in the very beginning stages and then as it spreads throughout to the Roman Empire, the Mediterranean world, we see this proclamation. It starts in Jerusalem. And as it's proclaimed in Jerusalem, the group of followers get bigger and bigger. Of course, it starts with Pentecost. And even in Pentecost, you have people from all over the Mediterranean world who are there to celebrate Pentecost. They experience the coming of the Holy Spirit. It says thousands of them became believers, and many of them went back home. And so we do know later on uh, that even the church at Rome was established probably by people who had been there at Pentecost. It starts in Jerusalem, and it starts out with the Palestinian Jews, the Jews who spoke Aramaic, but then it spread to the Jews that lived there in Jerusalem who had come out of the Hellenistic world, out of the Greek world, and their main language was Greek. So even within Jerusalem, it becomes a multicultural group of people, but it doesn't stop there, and it continues to spread through Judea and then over into Samaria, who had been Jews and Samaritans had been had been enemies for generations and generations and now the gospel has moved into Samaria and the power of the Holy Spirit comes down upon the Samaritans and then from there we see it move into the Gentile world in all different ways uh, through all different people and eventually we see that the gospel message reaches three continents Asia, Africa, and Europe. And so 
in that we begin to see the proclamation of the gospel, the good news that is done with boldness all over the Mediterranean world. We see new generations coming to know Christ. We see new generations who become leaders within the church and the ones that are also spreading the good news of Jesus Christ all over the Mediterranean. It's younger people uh, like Philip and like, uh, like uh, Stephen and others like that, even Paul. And then it's people that are uh, not just the Palestinian Jews, but the Hellenistic Jews. And then it moves out and it becomes Gentiles, Gentiles, even like Luke himself, who come to share the gospel. And then even breaks down, we see that women are sharing the gospel. And we see that the king of kingdom is being established by all different groups of people. And it's in so many different ways, unexpected. These are people that are, that are fishermen, that are tax collectors, that are enslaved and that are free. Some of them are wealthy and people of means, but all sorts of people. It's a new generation of leadership. And then we see the next generation of leadership with people like John Mark and people like Timothy and the daughters of Philip. Then we see throughout Acts that the establishment of the kingdom breaks down all sorts of barriers, social barriers. Particularly, we, we've seen, we've talked about um, uh, Jew and Gentile, slave and free, male and female. We talk about that a lot, but we see all of these barriers being broken down. The community of believers is a mutual and egalitarian community where Everyone inherent in, is, an, is, is an heir of God. And as the barriers are being broken, we see the struggles with this because this is difficult and yet it continues to happen. The barriers are being broken down. And this is a, 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 a place of conflict. It's difficult when barriers are broken down, but that's what happens in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is all about the breaking down of barriers, and we see it throughout the book of Acts. And then we see that the kingdom of God means that there's a new temple, that the old temple, that building and the tabernacle before it, that was a temporary situation. But now in Christ, and with the power of the Holy Spirit, the new temple is actually the community of the people of God, the community of believers. And once again, this is a way of breaking down barriers, not just physical barriers, that God isn't located in a particular physical location. The God, God is located in the community of believers as the community moves throughout the Mediterranean world and beyond. But not only that, the barriers that existed in the physical building of who could be where in the building, in the temple, go away as well. And so we see the new temple and the breaking down of all of these different kinds of physical and social limitations. And with that new kingdom that we see being established in the book of Acts, we hear the message. And the message for the Jew is that we need to come to a true understanding of who Messiah is and what Messiah means. And in that light, we understand what the law is about and we understand the temple. And we see that Jesus, the Messiah, is crucified, risen, for all nations. And for some, this is a difficult message, but this is the message. And it is the fulfillment of the promise made to Abraham when he said, your descendants will be like the stars. And as you are blessed, you are blessed to bless the nations. And we see this throughout the Hebrew scriptures. And so the message to the Jew is come to a true understanding of the Messiah and the Messiah is Jesus and this is good news for everybody 
Jew and Gentile. And the message to the Gentile is, throw away your idols, turn away, repent, turn away from your idols, turn away from everything that has to do with idolatry and worshiping false gods, and come to know the God that is the God of creation, come to know that God through Jesus Christ. Turn away from it. Turn away from the dead end, the dead end road that you've been on and turn toward the God of all creation. See, the God of all creation, that is the message to everyone from wherever they come. So now as we look at this passage, we see Paul is in Rome. Um, he got there. Last week he was not quite in Jerusalem in our message. And this week he's now all the way in Rome. And we can't possibly talk about everything that went on between Jerusalem and Rome, except let me just tell you that it started in Jerusalem and trouble brewed and one thing led to another and Paul ends up in Caesarea. And he comes before the governor, the Roman governor, both of them, and then uh, one after the other. He's, he was there some time, and then he sees the king, um, uh, King Agrippa II, and he preaches to all of them, but in the midst of that, he is sharing the message that he is indeed a true Jew. He's been accused that he has given up and forsaken and actually uh, worked against being a Jew. And he makes the case that indeed he is a true Jew that has come to follow Jesus. But he also is claims his Roman citizenship. And in claiming his Roman citizenship and claiming that he wants to see Caesar, in all of this. He wants to come before Caesar. He wants to be tried by Caesar and as a Roman citizen he has the right to that. And that sets that sets things in motion for him to head to Rome. And after a couple of years in Caesarea he finally goes to Rome mostly by ship. And in the midst of that he uh, he gets shipwrecked. He uh, ends up in Malta where he gets bit by a poisonous snake and one thing leads to another but he eventually ends up landing near Rome and the Christians in Rome hear that he's coming and they come to meet him and they escort him into Rome but because he's under he's in the custody of Roman soldiers he is wanting to have a, a, a a hearing before Caesar, he is under house arrest. So they put him under house arrest. He's there with a soldier guarding him, but he's allowed to have all sorts of guests and all sorts of people come to visit him. And so the message there as he comes to Rome is that he is a true Jew, but he's also a Roman citizen. And all of this stuff I've just told you, you really should read the book. In fact, I challenge you this week to sit down with one of the versions of the Bible and read the book of Acts from beginning to end. If you can read it in one sitting, that's great, or in a couple of sittings, read it like you would a novel. But read the book of Acts and see it all put together. So he makes a case. He decides that he wants to make a case to the Jewish leaders of Rome because all of the, he's afraid that word has come from Jerusalem and even Caesarea about what he's been accused of, that he's been accused of being uh, a traitor as a Jew. And he wants to set the record straight. And so all of these leaders come to his house because he can't go somewhere else. And he spends an entire day sharing with them the news of Jesus Christ. First of all, they say, no, we haven't heard anything. And so he's able to share with them the good news. And it says that they heard him, and many heard him over and over again. Some believed and some did not. And it ends there. Paul is proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about Jesus with all boldness 
and without hindrance. And there, that's where it le we, Luke leaves us. And you want to go, really? That's it? That's where you're going to leave us? Paul's sitting there. He hasn't seen Caesar yet. We've heard that Paul was a martyr. We're not going to get to that part. How did that happen? We don't know. Luke leaves us there. That's pretty cruel of Luke to do that. I want to know the ending. And we don't know why Luke leaves us there, really. It could be that at the time of the writing, Paul was still in prison and still in these circumstances. It could be that that is where, where at the time that Luke writes this, and in fact, much of Acts could very well be a case that is brought before Caesar about what Paul's ministry, what Paul's work has been about. But I also think that there's something else going on. Luke leaves us here because on one hand, by Paul being in Rome, the gospel message, the kingdom of God, the people of God have been witnesses all the way to the ends of the earth. You know, the saying goes that all roads lead to Rome. Well, if that's the case, then there's some probable mathematical principle that says if all roads lead to Rome, then that means all roads leave Rome and go out to all different kinds of places all over the place. If all roads lead to Rome, then all roads go out from Rome. And so from there, the message continues to go to the ends of the earth, but it doesn't stop with Paul. It doesn't even stop with Luke. It goes on. We don't even know. It could be some people think that Paul was able to go before Caesar, was acquitted, and went on to Spain. And it was when he came back to Rome for whatever reason under Nero, he was martyred. Others say, that no, he didn't go to Spain. But who knows, he went to Spain, maybe. There are other apostles that are known to have gone into, into Europe like that. There's the Ethiopian eunuch who brought the gospel back into Ethiopia, into Africa, and we know that there are Christian communities that mark their heritage back to that time. There was Thomas, who was, uh, tradition holds that he went to India the Apostle Thomas, and there are communities in India that trace their heritage back to Thomas. There's Philip and his daughters. You can't believe that Philip just sat still in Caesarea, and certainly not his daughters that prophesied. Who knows where Philip and his daughters went? There's Priscilla and Aquila. Every time they got kicked out of Rome for whatever reason, they went somewhere else, and they established a new church. Priscilla and, and Aquila continue sharing the gospel message, spreading the kingdom of God, establishing the kingdom of God all over. And then there's Cornelius, Cornelius the centurion, the first known Gentile, noted Gentile, who had the encounter with Peter and the spirit fell on his family. Where did his kids go? He was a soldier stationed in Caesarea. Who knows? Maybe they all moved somewhere else. And the next generation of Cornelius' household became witnesses to the ends of the earth. But with each generation, we are talking about the ends of the earth. The ends of the earth is not just a physical description, but it's one of time. And so the gospel continues. The kingdom continues to be established even now. We are the ends of the earth and it doesn't stop with us. We are about establishing the kingdom of God even now. 
And we do it just like we've seen in the book of Acts. There's proclamation with boldness. We continue to share the gospel. We share the message of the kingdom of God through words and deeds and actions, through our community and beyond to Redlands, all the way to the ends of the earth, literally to the ends of the earth. As the message continues with our brothers and sisters who go to all of these different places around the earth. And now with social media, you don't even have to get into an airplane. The proclamation with boldness goes from immigrants to immigrants and to the established, to people who are near, new here and people who have been here forever, to Democrats and to Republicans and whatever other things that you can think of that divide us. The proclamation of the kingdom of God goes to all of us. It goes to a new generation. We see this as we try and communicate the gospel to the young who are in our congregation as they grow up learning about Jesus from the time that they're born uh, and through Sunday school and church and mentoring and all of the things that happen in church. But we continue to share the gospel to that next generation even outside of the walls of our church. And we try it in new forms of communication. I don't know if any of you have been watching America's Got Talent, but this week is the finals. And there are five acts that are still in the finals. And one of them is a man whose name is Brendan Leak. And he is known as a spoken word poet. I became familiar with spoken word uh, when I was at Purdue University and I got to know some students who were actively involved. It mostly happened in different um, presentations and shows and, and uh, um, special events that were put on by the Black Cultural Center. And you would go for an evening of spoken word. Sometimes it would be done in the coffee houses, but it was this beautiful poetry that came together, rhythmic, almost like rap, but not exactly. It was like rap meets preaching. The powerful messages of spoken word poetry. And we see now on America's Got Talent that someone has come as a spoken word poet and is in the top five finalists. It is a communication, it's a mode of communication. And we need to explore all different kinds of communication, whether it's that or music or art forms. We need to realize that some of them are going to be in person and others are gonna be through social media and technology. But we have a whole new generation that speaks a different language and we need to learn that language. And we need to share the kingdom of God to a new generation. We need to continue to break down social barriers. And just as it was hard for those Christians back in Acts to deal with the, all of the ramifications of breaking down social barriers, all the difficulties of it, it's our job too. And it's not going to always be easy. But if we are followers of Jesus, if it is our job to be witnesses of the God of all creation, establishing the kingdom of God, if this is our job, then it's our job to begin to understand others and love others, even if it's difficult, even if it's a struggle, even if it requires reconciliation on our part. That's our job. Because what we're about, bringing the kingdom of God into this world, requires the breaking down of social barriers. We need to be the new temple. And the new temple breaks down physical barriers. 
and we carry God with us everywhere we go. And we're not limited by physical space. And finally, our message. Our message needs to be shared in our age to the people within our community. But not just that, in our time, in the difficulties, in the struggles, struggles of a pandemic, struggles of natural disasters, of global warming, struggles of, of civil unrest, struggles that we can we continue to experience and see on the news and can completely defeat us if we allow it. But our message has to be this. Our message has to be one of repentance that we as God's people all over the world need to turn away from the dead end roads that we're on. Turn around and come toward Jesus. Come be a part of the kingdom of God. We need to believe in a Jesus who rose from the dead. We need to be resurrection people knowing that the day will come that we too will be resurrected. Jesus has defeated death and therefore we have hope. Let us be people of hope in hopeless times. Jesus is Lord. We are all about the kingdom of God. And we believe in a God who is the God of all creation. The story goes on to the ends of the earth. It's our turn. <laughs>